God's heart is that the wrath of God be removed. The judge's heart is that he may find a just way to let his heart of mercy flow. This is not constraint by the lawyer on a judge because of some technicality of the cross. So how does God's heart for those he delivers from his wrath transform the way we relate to him? The answer to that question is what John Piper rejoices over from Isaiah 53 in this episode of Light and Truth. This sermon was originally preached at Bethlehem Baptist Church on April 4th, 1993. You know somebody's heart when you know their desires, when you know what satisfies them, which means that this passage that Mike just read is about the heart of God. And if you see what his desires are in this text, you can know him well. So this message this morning is about knowing God. Verse 10, the Lord was pleased, literally, the Lord desired, it was his good pleasure to crush him, putting him to grief. So if you want to know the heart of God, you begin with the knowledge that his desire is to crush his servant. That's the starting point. God's good pleasure is to crush his servant and put him to grief. And then if you want to know the heart of the servant, you see in verse 10, at the last line, the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. So the servant takes this desire of the father to crush him and he makes it succeed. And in verse 11, as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. Now, that's a glimpse into the heart of, of God. And I think there is no need greater in this church and there is no need greater in this city than to know God. Nothing makes sense in the Bible if you don't know God. Sin makes no sense if you don't know God. Hell makes no sense if you don't know God. Heaven makes no sense if you don't know God. The Ten Commandments make no sense if you don't know God. If you don't know God... It's no wonder that everything else is meaningless. And therefore, I really want us this morning to just stand before the Lord and let him reveal to us who he is through the work of the servant. And and what I see in this text is eight acts of the servant, which is really the heart of God prospering through the hand of the servant, yielding the satisfaction of the servant. And so if you feel like this morning you've walked in here distant from the Lord, like you haven't known him, he's not clear in your mind, I hope that you will just sit back, whisper a prayer right now that God would open your heart and your mind and let these eight acts of his holy servant Jesus reveal him to you. Number one, the servant knew the purposes of the Lord. Middle of verse 11, by his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify many. Take that phrase, by his knowledge, something happens. That's an effective knowledge. Something happens by the knowledge of the servant and therefore The first act of the servant is to know something. The first work of Jesus Christ is to know something. Now, what did he know? 
He knew the good pleasure of the Father. He took the purpose and the good pleasure of the Father into His hand, and it prospered in His hand. He looked at it, He accepted it, He knew it, which means that the purpose of the Father to crush the Son didn't sneak up on the Son. Had it been an accidental death, had God just kind of slipped up on Him against His will and put Him to death, it would have no saving significance. Nobody would be saved by a rebellious servant. It was his obedience, Paul says in Philippians 2, unto death that saves. And therefore, the first work of the Son is to know and receive. He knew what was coming. He said yes to it. And by his knowledge, everything else in this text has meaning and validity. Number two. The servant poured out himself, his soul, to death. The middle of verse 12. Because he poured out his soul to death. Or the first line of verse 11. He had anguish of soul. Or the third line of verse 10. He renders himself as a guilt offering. Very simply what these words mean is that the servant died. He died. He didn't just suffer. He didn't just get tormented. He didn't just have wounds. He didn't just have stripes. He wasn't just rejected. He went all the way and he made himself an offering and he poured out his soul to death. He laid down his life according to the knowledge of the Father's purpose to crush him. He accepted it and he died under it. Number three, the servant bore the sin of many. Next to last line in verse 12. Yet he himself bore the sin of many. In the last line of verse 11. He will bear their iniquities. In other words, his death now is not like the death of any other human being. There have been many deaths. Elsie died. Elsie's death. And the death of Jesus are radically different deaths. Because in Jesus' death, he bore Elsie's sin. And when Elsie died, she had no sin to bear. That's the difference between those two deaths. Sins are not born twice. If you carry your sin today... You despise the cross. You say, in effect, it was not an adequate bearing that he did. It was not a sufficient sin bearing. This text is false. God blew it. Christ was inadequate. If you're carrying guilt today, that's what you're saying. You don't want to say that. You do not want to say that. Rather, what you want to say is, this is Holy Week. This is the week in which we focus on a sin-bearing servant who is crushed by the purpose of the Father. And the purpose of the Father is not hatred for the Son, but hatred for sin and love for me. And therefore, He puts my sin, which He hates, on this Son whom He loves and crushes Him that I might live and have no guilt and no condemnation forever. That's what Holy Week is about. Number four, the servant rose from the dead. You know, when Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 4, that he was raised according to the Scriptures, I believe this is one of the texts that he has in mind in the Scriptures. Verse 10 after saying that the servant gives himself as a guilt offering, he says, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days. Now that's after making himself an offering for sin, he will prolong his days, which I take to mean he will live again with length 
of days. Or look at verse 11 at the beginning. After his anguish, he will see and be satisfied. In other words, when he has anguish and pours out his soul unto death, he does not cease to be, nor does he go to the place of the dead where there's only misery. It says he will experience anguish, he will pour out his soul, and then he will see, and then he will be satisfied with length of days. He will be raised from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is prophesied in these verses in Isaiah 53. Number five. The servant interceded for the transgressors. Verse 12, the last line. He bore our sin, bore the sin of many, and he interceded for the transgressors. Now, this takes us a step beyond the sin-bearing death, the glorious, triumphant resurrection. Now you have him interceding, that is, pleading. I mean, it would be real easy to abuse this doctrine and say, aha, if Jesus must constantly intercede for me, with the Father, then God's against me, Jesus is for me. That's why you've got to always have this lawyer in the court. Because the judge is mean. All he cares about is getting the sentence right on the punishment for the sin. And there's the, then there's this nice lawyer, Jesus. And he is the good guy and God is the bad guy. And thank, not God, but thank Jesus, that there's Jesus. We can somehow get around God into glory. That is the worst possible abuse of the gospel. And it's all right here, the revelation of that abuse, because it was the good pleasure of God to provide the intercession. It is God's will to provide Jesus to placate God. God's heart is that the wrath of God be removed. The judge's heart is that he may find a just way to let his heart of mercy flow. This is not constraint by the lawyer on a judge because of some technicality of the cross. This is the open heart of the judge saying, I love to let this lawyer sway me. I glory in his case. Because I thought it up. And Jesus does this for us. And I say it's a mystery. I don't know why God set it up this way, that we should need an intercessor. But we have one. God provided him. He knew that. He embraced it. He willingly, in heaven today, at God's right hand. What does it say in in Romans 8, 34? Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who is raised, who is at the Father's right hand, who intercedes for us forever. He has an indestructible life. No one can remove Jesus from the Father's right hand, and therefore no one can remove you from the Father's right hand. He intercedes infallibly and successfully. The will of the Lord prospers in his hand. He's interceding for you right now. Number six. The servant justifies his people. Next to the last line in verse 11. My servant will justify many. If he bore our sin in death, then our sin has been punished. And if our sin has been punished, we bear it no more. And if we bear it no more... There is no more guilt. And if there is no more guilt, we are acquitted and just before the Father. And so the doctrine of justification, glorious and beautiful as it is, was already there in the Old Testament. And now we see what this great redemption is up to. God has been working to provide your acquittal in all of these works of the servant. 
His heart is not condemnation. His heart is justification. Number seven. The servant bears offspring in his death and resurrection. He bears offspring. Middle of verse 10. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. Now, Isaiah doesn't say much about this. The offspring of the work of the servant. The offspring. The seed. Literal translation. The seed. So what can we say about it? I think we can say at this at least this much. When the servant dies, and when he rises again, he not only provides the basis for our justification, that is, the declaration that the ungodly are now acquitted, he also provides the basis for an, a new birth, a new character, a new being a likeness to God as offspring of his son. And so it seems to me that in saying he will justify many and he will see offspring, these two problems are dealt with in the cross of Jesus. He justifies by removing guilt and declaring righteous, and he takes care of the alienation character problem by saying, I will beget you anew by my cross and my resurrection. You will be begotten anew unto a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And I will draw you in as new people into the family of God. So there's no more estrangement and your character will become now conformed to the image of the Son who begot you. So there is offspring. And finally, number eight, finally. The servant divides the booty with the strong or the spoil. First two lines of verse 12. Therefore, because of this death, I will allot him a portion with the great and he will divide the booty or the spoils with the strong. Now, In verse 10, it says he'll see his offspring. In verse 11, it says he will justify many. And in verse 12, it says he's going to divide the spoil with the strong. I think those three groups of people are the same people. The justified many, the offspring who are the children of God, and the strong with whom he shares the spoil of his triumphs are the church, the people of God. You are justified You are the children of God. You are the heirs of his triumph. His will in coming through death, getting victory over death, rising and taking captivity captive and giving gifts to men is that he might share the universe with his family. We are fellow heirs with Christ, heirs of God, and we will know the inheritance of the earth. Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. So let's just stand back now. We could take all eight of them, but let's just take the last three and ask how they connect with our hearts this morning. You all, right now, have three fundamental longings. You have more, but there are three that I know are in your heart. I know them from myself. I know them from experience. I know them from the Word. You have a longing to get rid of your guilt. You hate a bad conscience. Nobody likes a bad conscience. Nobody likes the horrible feelings of having done stuff they disapprove of, and even worse, God disapproves of. Nobody likes to go to bed with a guilty conscience. It's even worse to get up with a guilty conscience and face a day with a heaviness on you that you've done wrong and you're guilty. That is a longing that everybody in this room has, namely to get rid of that problem. And there are worldly ways to try to get rid of it. You try to drown it. That's about all you can do in the world is drown it. Turn on the TV and somehow try to forget it. That'll never work. It only drives it deeper and it flares out in all kinds of utterly unpredictable, undesirable ways. There's only one way 
and that is God's way. He bore our sins and to trust him to just lay it on Jesus and say, I can hardly believe this is true. This is really too good to be true. But by the grace of God, I will believe that it's true and that I have no guilt. Jesus bore it all. He's totally sufficient. That's need number one. Need number two is that alienation problem. Nobody likes to be cut off from significant people. Lonely. Totally estranged. Alienated. And sinking. And therefore this whole issue of offspring becomes so precious. He wants us not only to be okay legally before the law so that you can pass through the court. It's not the feeling when you get to the word offspring, children. God also has not only that legal holiness dimension that will be made right by the cross, but then there's this big everlasting arm dimension that goes out and says, I want family. I don't want just legally acquitted criminals. I want family. And therefore, that need is met this morning if you will have it. And the third need and longing is we want to be resourceful people who are not so broke that we can't bring our best resolves into reality. Isn't it awful when you have a good purpose that you want to perform and you don't have the resources to do it? Either material resources or physical resources. How many people lie in bed sick with so many good resolves that they cannot execute because they're paralyzed or too old or sick in some way. And how many of us then don't have the emotional resources to bring? One of these days, here's the point of the booty, the spoils. One of these days, that risen Lord who took captivity captive and now has by right everything in the universe and can dispense it to whom he will as he wills, he is going to share the spoils with the strong when they come out of the grave with him. And therefore, never in eternity again will you have a strong, good inclination for which you don't have the resources in. Now, I just want to ask you to trust Jesus this morning because you all have those longings and the fulfillment of those longings is here in Christ. It was prophesied 700 years before it happened. It happened with perfect accuracy and glorious fulfillment in the Good Friday. And today, by the Spirit, it's available to you through faith. And I invite you, I urge you, I plead with you, put your faith in this all-sufficient servant, Jesus Christ. This is Light and Truth, God-centered preaching to help you see Christ clearly and treasure Him truly. I'm your host, Dan Kruver. Thank you for listening. On our next episode, John Piper will preach a sermon titled, The Chief End of God, the first sermon in a three-part series about God's global glory. I hope you'll join us. For more resources, visit DesiringGod.org.